The governor of the state of Illinois has declared a gubernatorial disaster proclamation in response to the COVID-19 outbreak. And all of the village of Glendor Heights is covered by the disaster area. In light of the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak, the village president of the village of Glendale Heights has determined that an in-person meeting for the October 7, 2021 village board meeting is not practical or prudent in light of the disaster. All of the trustees of the village board participating in the October 7, 2021 village board meeting wherever their physical location shall be verified and determined that they can hear one and other and can hear all discussions and testimony during the meeting. Sain Chaudhary M. Kokhar, village president of the village of Glendale Heights, dated October 7, 2021. I would like to call this village board meeting of Thursday, October 7, 2021, to order. Will you please, clerk, take the roll? President Coker? Yes. <clears throat> Trustee Schmidt? Here. Trustee Siddiqui? Here. Trustee Light? Trustee Miritato? Here. Trustee Pojak? Here. Trustee Schroeder? Here. Please stand and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. We will continue with petitions and communications. Community announcement. Trustee Schmidt, please. Thank you. You will. The village of Glendale Heights is looking for hardworking individuals to join our team. We are now offering a variety of career opportunities for full-time, part-time, and seasonal positions. The Parks, Recreation, and Facilities Department is now hiring for a variety of recreation positions, including program facility coordinators, seasonal recreation attendants, and seasonal youth counselors. And the Glendale Lakes Golf Club is hiring cooks, a banquet coordinator, waitstaff, and a dishwasher. For more information on these job opportunities or for additional career postings, please visit www.glendaleheights.org slash HR or contact Human Resources at 630-909-5357. The next coffee and chat with the village president and board will be Saturday, November 6th at the Center for Senior Citizens from 10 a.m. to noon. If you are unable to attend and have any comments, suggestions, or questions for the village president or village board, please call the village president's office anytime at 630-909-5302. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Trustee Sneaky, please. Thank you. You're the village of Glendale Heights encourages residents to bookmark the village website to your homepage of your smartphones. Our mobile-friendly website will give you a quick access to a variety of tools, including access to pay your water bill, important information about upcoming programs and events, report a concern, and quick access to contact your district trustee or the village president. The village website also has a links to all the village departments, including the parks, recreation, and facilities website, Glendale Lakes Golf Club website, and more. For more information or for assistance on adding the village website to the home screen of your smartphone, please contact the Public Relations Division at 630-909-5348 or contact your children. They know better nowadays smartphones. Yeah. Uh, DuPage County is now offering a two-year crisis only. 
Low Income Household Water Assistance Program. This program provides one-time assistance to provide disconnection, restore a water connection, and helps with fees associated to your water bill. The contact, the total benefit for one household is $1,500 for water and sewer. Residents can apply through DuPage County anytime during the two years this program is being offered. DuPage County staff will review your water and sewer bills to determine how much needs to be paid for the required service. If you are at risk of disconnection or your service has already been disconnected, you can call 630-407-6500. Thank you. Welcome, Trustee. Karaj, submit, please. The Family Health and Safety Fair Committee the Village of Glendale Heights, and the Northern Illinois Food Bank are hosting a food distribution event this Saturday, October 9th, from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. at Camera Park. You do not need to be a resident of Glendale Heights in order to receive assistance, and no identification is required. We ask that you please wear a face covering and remain in your vehicle. Please drive slow and follow the directions from the staff and volunteers upon arrival. We want to thank all of the supporting organizations for their help in making sure no family or individual goes hungry. For more information or to volunteer, please contact the Sports Hub at 630-260-6060. The Family Health and Safety Fair was canceled this year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, the Family Health and Safety Fair Committee will still be offering a drive through flu shot clinic this Saturday, October 9th, from 9 a.m. to noon at the Civic Center parking lot. The flu shot clinic is free and you do not need to be insured to receive the flu shot. For more information, please contact the Sports Hub at 630-260-6060. And remember, get the shot, not the flu. Thank you. Trustee Maritato, please. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. During the months of October and November, parking restrictions will be in effect from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. due to sweet street sweeping. Color coded no parking signs are posted in four different zones throughout the village. Parking is prohibited on Monday for the red zone, Tuesday for the blue zone, Wednesday for the green zone, and Friday for the brown zone. To find out your zone, visit the village website. For any questions on street sweeping program, please contact Public Works at 630 2606040. Spine chilling ghosts and goblins creatures are taken over Camber Park for one night only Spookorama event. Reserve your time slot today for Haunted Camber Park Trail. Brave explorers will be led on a guided walk through trail hair raising scare stations. The Haunted House Park Trail is Friday, October 29th, from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. Pre-registration pre is required, and the tour time must be chosen at the time of registration. This event will be held weather permitting. If you are interested in volunteering or for more information, please contact the Sports Hub at 630 Two six zero six zero six zero. Thank you. You're welcome. Trustee Project, please. Thank you. You are. The village of Glendale Heights is getting into the Halloween spirit. Halloween is on Sunday, October thirty first, and we would like to remind residents that trick or treating hours are from three p.m. to seven p.m. Also on Halloween evening, we invite children fifteen and under to come and trick or treat at Safety Town Halloween for a safe and family-friendly event. Safety Town Halloween runs from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. For, for more information on Safety Town Halloween, please contact Tanya Mako, 630-909-5459. Thank you. 
You're welcome. Trustee Schroeder, please. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Stop by the Center for Senior Citizens on Tuesday, October the 19th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for the Super Senior Mobile Unit. This program is a great way to renew your driver's license, take a rules of the road class, and have a vision screening exam. The rules of the road class run from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., and registration is required for this class. Registration is not required for all other driving services. For more information, please call 630-260-60650. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. We have the following proclamation, a proclamation to proclaim September 29, 2021 as World Heart Day. A proclamation to proclaim the month of October as National Breast Cancer Awareness Month. A proclamation to proclaim the month of October as Filipino. A proclamation to pro proclaim the month of October as I did a American hist uh, Filipino American History Month. N next is a proclamation to proclaim the month of October as Arts Two Page Month. A proclamation of condemnation. Um, Commendation for Hope Fair Housing Center, a proclamation recognizing LNI Secretary of State J.C. White, a proclamation recognizing the retirement of Police Chief Doug Flint. If there are no objections, I will sign these proclamations. Is there any objection from anybody from public or any? Go for if it. There's, if there's none, I will sign. Um, we now move on to recognition of the retirement of Police Chief Doug Flint. Mike Merrin, please. Thank you, Mayor and Board. You will. Okay. Chief Flint, <laughs> you get to stand up here this time. Wow. <clears throat> <clears throat> So tonight it is my honor to recognize the closing of a chapter for Chief Doug Flint in the Glendale Heights Police Department. Chief Flint announced his retirement as Chief of Police last month, which became effective on September 27th. Chief Flint proudly served the residents of this community as a police officer for over 33 years. Starting his career in Glendale Heights in July of 1988, just in time, to work his first Summerfest. And we can call it Summerfest because that's what it was called then. Doug grew up in Addison, graduated from Illinois State University and began working here six months after graduation. He attended the Cook County Police Academy, was assigned to the patrol division upon his return. During his career, Doug was also assigned as a detective, special operations unit detective, investigation sergeant, deputy chief of support operations, and I believe you also taught the GREAT program, correct? I did. Throughout his career, Doug received many awards and recognitions, including five Division Meritorious Awards. And looking through Doug's numerous awards, it was easy to see how much he enjoyed being the police. Commendations ranged from him making apprehensions of sus suspects doing car burglaries, armed robbery suspects, a subject in possession of 10 pounds of cannabis. He caught a couple of suspects stealing a sea dew watercraft. That doesn't happen every day and worked a drug case that resulted in locating cannabis, heroin, mushrooms, not the kind you eat with your steak, and $11,000 in cash that was later forfeited. Doug received a meritorious uh, award for his role in finding a seven-year-old girl whom had been abducted from Wheaton. The award states in part, Patrolman Flint utilized extensive knowledge and experience and recognized the urgency involved with an incident of this kind too often Child abduction has turned into tragedy. Information, information revealed through a subsequent investigation that this incident held a high risk of just such a tragedy. Patrol officers Flint and his partner at the time, Kirstein, tenaciously pursued their investigation and refused to allow circumstances to dictate against a successful conclusion. So there is a 
Now, I'm not sure how old that seven-year-old girl is now, but she celebrated a lot of birthdays since then, Doug. And then there was a, that little investigation in which an informant that Doug had developed uh, helped lead to a multi-year, multi-jurisdictional investigation that dismantled the Glendale Heights Latin Kings with 11 members being arrested and resulted in 105 Windsor being forfeited, cleaning up the Glen Hill neighborhood, which was the final blow to the Windsor Lane Latin Kings. What stands out in all of these rec uh, commendations is Doug's compassion for the residents he served and the teamwork that he utilized with his partners and later, his career, later on in his career, on his shift and in his division. A pri prime example of the teamwork is the night he was a sergeant in charge of the midnight shift. At 3 a.m., Officer Somerville had stopped a vehicle and two of the three occupants fled as soon as the vehicle stopped. At nearly the same time, the police department was receiving a call for a man down on the sidewalk on James Court. The man had been the victim of a shooting. With only four officers on his shift, they were able to secure the arrestee, search for the two that had fled, render aid to the shooting victim, and secure the crime scene. It was the teamwork that Doug fostered with a shift that made it possible. Turns out the arrestee that Officer Somerville had in custody was ultimately charged with the murder of the victim on James Court. Teamwork and leadership served Doug well throughout his career, but especially as chief of police. Doug has done a phenomenal job as chief. The mantra vision, mission, vision, values, I can't say it as well as he can, um, it was not just a phrase Doug threw around, he lived it. He instilled it in every facet of the police department. He has continued to create a positive relationship between the community and the police. Even when times got tough, he insisted on transparency with the community. This led to, with the support of the Board of Trustees, the full implementation of the body camera program in which every officer now on the department is equipped with a body camera. He has looked for positive solutions to issues, such as the co-responder program for mental health services or the police officer peer support program that he started in Glendale Heights. The peer support program was such a positive step that some of our officers involved in the program went to Chicago Police Department recently to assist CPD officers after the shooting death of Officer Ella French. Most recently, one of the CALEA assessors stated the program should be a model for other departments to emulate. Speaking of CALEA, not only has the department been re-accredited under his watch, it has achieved a standard that few departments across the country achieve, having met 100% of the CALEA standards, both mandatory and optional. Or as in CALEA speak, other than optional, right? Something like that. It, I see Larry giving me the, the yes back there, so. <laughs> Doug has been a dedicated coach in youth sports since his boys could play. And Doug brought that coach mentality to the job every day, whether it was coaching up a new officer, ensuring department-wide training was conducted on a regular basic, basic, base, you know what I mean? Instilling teamwork or just helping a kid he met on the street with an encouraging word. I am certain that this will carry over into his new role and whatever else may lie ahead. Chief Flint, thank you for putting yourself in harm's way for the better part of 33 years to protect this village and its residents and for your dedicated servant leadership to the men and women of the Glendale Heights Police Department. I think it is safe to say that you have left the department better than you found it and it is something to be proud of. Congratulations on your retirement as chief and starting the next chapter in your life. proclamation that the mayor has signed and the board has approved. Thank you. Your plaque, which reads, an appreciation of 33 years dedicated service to the Glendale Heights Police Department and to the community. As of September 21st, 2021. And like the prize package here. Dear members of the FOP Lodge, this is going to be fun to pop all the front. This is something that normally happens at the retirement party. So 
awkward moment, sorry. It would have been better if we had a wrap. Yeah. I had a knife. All right, there we go. How many, how many, how many chiefs does it take? All right. Your shadow box of wow. all the badges that you have had as a police officer. <laughs> Mayor Coker has a, uh, an item on behalf of the residents of the village. for your services as a police officer. It's not a booking phone. No, I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it's back in the archives. Holy cow. Have you seen that picture? <laughs> Impressive, isn't it? So love me? Uh, um, I'm not used to being on uh, that side of it all. But Mike, uh, sincerely, thank you. That was uh, well-researched. I know why your door was closed all day. Um, thank you. Uh, sincerely, from the bottom of my heart to everybody for spending 33 years here in a village I love, in a department I love, with people I care deeply about and love. Uh, it's been a truly wonderful 33-year experience. Uh, to the retired officer here, thank you very much. Uh, it was awesome working with everybody. I have nothing but great memories of everything we've done together for as long as we work together. And it's been a joy and pleasure to um, just be here every day and be with everybody and watch officers grow and mature and watch officers achieve whatever goals they want to achieve and get the careers they want to get. Uh, that's more meaningful than anything. Uh, watching just young recruits and young officers get to where they want to get to is, is the best feeling you can have when you are leading men through uh, what we actually are in battle every day. And when you, when you see them come out and be successful and have great careers, that makes everything you do and all the sacrifices you make worthwhile uh, for everybody. Um, so I'm off script, but that's how I generally do things. Uh, Mayor and board, thank you for the recognition of 33 years of service. It, it truly means a lot to me to be recognized here today uh, for this. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Mayor Jackson five years ago and the board five years ago for believing in me for the position of uh, chief to lead men and women of the police department. Uh, those five years have flown. Uh, we've been through a lot. We've had several major incidents that we've gotten through. We've accomplished a lot. We've set the goals, achieved the goals that we've set out to, to do as far as stuff that uh, Mike mentioned with body cameras and Kalia, uh, peer support, uh, a whole bunch of different things that we set out to do and we did. I hope that uh, I did leave the place better than we found it because that's the goal of every person coming in. Uh, I hope I didn't let anybody down during those five years. I hope we've achieved everything that, that we wanted to achieve. Uh, I'd like to thank the DuPage County Chiefs uh, who allowed me as a new chief way back five years ago to ask questions and learn from past experiences. DuPage County has great leadership in law enforcement. Uh, the professional within this county is by far, bar none, the best in the state. Uh, nothing compares to the professionalism of DuPage County law enforcement. Uh, and in, in closing, just to my family, um, boys, Barb, come up here. So my family, my wife, Barb, my two sons, Jordan and Jake. Uh, Jordan and Jake, being the son of police officers is no easy task. 
You had to put up with a dad who worked midnight shift for much of my career. Uh, I wasn't always happy then. I was kind of crabby for a lot of the times, but they understood. They put up with it. Uh, they understood when I missed some events and holidays. For instance, tonight is Jordan's birthday, and we're here, right? But they get it because that's what we do in government, and that's what we do in law enforcement, right? We're not at everything. Um, they're always here to support my. They were always there to support my career. Whatever it is I wanted to do, they supported. Uh, every step up the ladder, if you will, they supported. Even though it meant going from a day shift to a midnight shift, they understood it. Uh, always understood when we had a long case. It sometimes lasted days. They knew at a young age the importance the law enforcement officer plays in the safety of a community. And they understood that, and they let me play the police and be the police because they knew that it was important for everybody that we go catch bad guys. And they really didn't complain at all. Um, it was fun watching them grow up as a you know, person in law enforcement because you have a whole different perspective of how other kids live and how bad things can be, and you appreciate all the good things and positive things that you have in your life. So thank you, boys, for that. Barb. Yeah, I think it is tough. Wow. I thank God each and every day for bringing you into my life. Our world has not been the same since we met 30 years ago at Glen Oaks Hospital. Yes, we are that couple who met in the emergency room as a police officer. You supported me in all my positions, allowed me time to go back to school, believed in me from the beginning. Your support has made me who I am today. Thank you for raising our two, our two awesome kids and allowing me to chase my dreams and my career. I'm forever indebted to the sacrifices you've made for me. Forever indebted. Thank you. I've loved my time being a police officer here in Glendale Heights. I'll always be a cop at heart. As I transition to a new role, uh, I will never forget the experience of the coolest and greatest profession on earth, being a police officer. Thank you. God bless you. And I look forward to continuing working with everyone in the village to keep the village on a positive path. So thank you very much, Mayor Coker and the board, uh, for everything here tonight, but for everything for the past 33 years, because without the support of the mayor and the board, law enforcement is in a bad place, and we're in a great place because we have a great board. We have a board that supports, a mayor and a board that supports law enforcement in every which way, and without that support, uh, we wouldn't be where we're at today with all the equipment we have and all the training we have and the professional officers that we have. So thank you, uh, and I will uh, ask for a few minutes, Mayor, if we can take some pictures for just a five-minute recess. Uh, I will add, uh, if your uh, missus, uh, she wants to say something, you know, about your retirement, you know. I'm not, <laughs> if she wants to, but I'm not sure you're prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, I didn't, get, didn't expect to get put on the spot, but I just want to thank all of you as well for 33 wonderful years. Um, I couldn't ask for a better partner in life. I know he's been very happy, and um, he's had a great career, and I can't thank you guys enough for your support as well. It's meant a lot to my family. Um, wow. I can't believe it's actually here, and he's retiring. <laughs> um, thank you again. Kind of right, kind of. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to the officer to here. Thank you to the retired guys. Uh, it's been an honor working with everybody. And uh, Mr. Flint, happy re <laughs> retirement from police, but we are not done, you know. I know. <laughs> Take some time, then there is swearing in, you know, as an assistant village administrator. Later, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll, actually, we'll take that oath, yeah. and then we'll break for yeah, pictures, because right. that'll be a natural break. Hey, uh, Doug, I got something to say, if you don't mind. Oh, of course, Chester. <laughs> I have to say this. Five years ago, I was out in Hawaii on vacation. I get a call from Linda Jackson, the mayor, and she says, I got uh, a new chief, and she mentioned Doug Flint. I said, who the heck is Doug Flint? <laughs> And I said, did you recruit him from the outside or what? No, no, he's one of our officers. I said, have, have I ever seen him? And she says, yeah, you met him, I think. Describe him to me. So she described you. Short fat guy? <laughs> you hit the nail on the head. And, 
And uh, I said, Doug, oh, now I remember him. Yeah. And we Good choice. And we voted Go no. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Would you please raise your right hand and repeat after me? I, Douglas R. Flint, I, Douglas R. Flint, having been appointed to the position of Assistant Village Administrator, having been appointed to the position of Assistant Village Administrator, in the Village of Glendale Heights, in the Village of Glendale Heights, in the County of DuPage aforesaid, in the County of DuPage aforesaid, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of Illinois and the Constitution of the State of Illinois and that I will faithfully discharge the duties of Assistant Village Administrator and I will faithfully discharge the duties of Assistant Village Administrator to the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Congratulations. And thank you again, Mayor. And if you could take a five minute recess, that'd be yes. great. Thank you. No, you just say we're in recess. Oh, okay, it's so, a uh, recess for uh, photo shoots, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well done. We now go on public discussion of agenda items. Is there anyone in the public that would like to address? this board on an agenda items. So none, we will continue with the concert agenda. You have the concert agenda before you. Board Village Administrator, Mike Marin, please read the concert agenda. Absolutely, Mayor. You will. Number one is the approval of the regular board meeting minutes of September 16th, 2021. Number two is the approval of the Committee of the Whole meeting minutes of September 16th, 2021. Number three is the approval of the counts payable listing of October 7th, 2021 in the amount of $2,227,603.97. Number four, a resolution to approve and authorize the execution of an agreement between the Village of Glendale Heights, Illinois and Christopher B. Burke Engineering Limited for the furnishing of professional engineering services for the complete monitoring and management of four wetland stormwater basins in the village of Glendale Heights, Illinois. This is resolution 2021-R-98. Number five, a resolution to approve and authorize the execution of the first amendment to the intergovernmental agreement by and between the Board of Education of Queen Bee School District 16 in the village of Glendale Heights. This is resolution 2021-R-99. Number six is a resolution authorizing the execution of change order number two for the water main lining project, various locations in the village of Glendale Heights, Illinois. This is resolution 2021-R-100. Number seven is a motion to approve pay request number one to J. Congdon Sewer Service Incorporated for the water main lining project, various locations, in the amount not to exceed $273,853.06. This has been attorney approved. Number eight, a motion to approve pay request number one to Schroeder and Schroeder Incorporated for the 2021 sidewalk removal and replacement program in the total amount not to exceed $122,318.61. This has been attorney approved. Number nine is a motion to approve pay request number eight to V3 Construction Group Limited for the East Branch Tributary Number no. 2 Channel Maintenance Project and the total amount not to exceed $7,168.50. This has been attorney approved. Number 10 is a motion to approve pay request number 5 to Kloss Brothers Incorporated for the Camera Park Improvement Project and the total amount not to exceed $105,812.05. This has been attorney approved. Number 11 is a motion to approve pay request number 3 to J. Congdon Sewer Service for the CDBG Glen Hill Drive Water Main Replacement Project with a total amount not to exceed $210,610.11. This has been attorney approved. 
And number 12 is the approval of the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? First, um, Mari, uh, Trustee Maritato. Uh, motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. And second is uh, uh, Mr. Pojak, you know. Did no, you read? Oh, Marie, second. not me. Okay. Uh, Trustee Schroeder. Roll call vote, please. Trustee Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Siddiqui? Yes. Trustee Light? Oh, sorry. Trustee Miritato? Yes. Trustee Pojic? Yes. Trustee Schroeder? Yes. The concert agenda is approved. There is no old business, so we will move to new business. New business. There is a request to waive first reading uh, on new business item four. Is there a motion to waive first reading on new business item four? First, Mary Schroeder. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, Trustee Maritato. Discussion. None. Roll call vote, please. Trustee Siddiqui? Yes. Trustee Miritato? Yes. Trustee Pojak? Yes. Trustee Schroeder? Yes. Trustee Schmidt? Yes. First reading is waived on new business item four. Number two, an ordinance to approve and authorize the execution of a renewal of the agreement for professional services by and between Mazero Insurance Services Incorporation and the village of Glendale Heights. First reading. Number three, an ordinance providing for the termination of the North Avenue Glen Allen Road TIF number one redevelopment project area TIF on December 31st, 2021 from the September 16, 2021 COW. First reading. Number four, an ordinance amending Article G entitled Amusement Tax of Chapter 2, entitled Village Taxes of Title 3, entitled Finance. Taxation of the Village of Colonial Heights Village Code first reading is waived. This is Ordinance 2021-69. Can I get a motion to approve Ordinance 2021-69? First, Mary Schroeder, Trustee so Mary Schroeder. So moved. Second, Second uh, Trustee Siddiqui. Discussion. None. Uh, roll call vote, please. Trustee Miritato? Yes. Trustee Pojak? Yes. Trustee Schroeder? Yes. Trustee Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Siddiqui? Yes. Ordinance 2021-69 is approved. Number five, an ordinance pertaining to the receipt and use of monies received from the Coronavirus Physical Recovery Fund for the Village of Glendale Heights, DuPage County, LNI, first reading. We now go on to public discussion of agenda items. Is there anyone in the public that would like to address this board on an agenda item? None. There's no executive session. I would seek motion to adjourn. First, uh, Mary, Trustee Mary Schroeder. Second, to okay. adjourn. Second, Trustee Pojic. Second. Roll call vote, please. Excuse me, who did the second? Uh, Trustee I second. Uh, Maritato. Trustee Schroeder? Yes. Trustee Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Siddiqui? Yes. Trustee Miritato? Yes. Trustee Pojak? Yes. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs> Trustee Siddiqui, you have the committee of whole.
Thank you. You're welcome. Committee of the Whole in session, date on October 7th. Roll call, please. Mayor Coker? Yes. Trustee Schmidt? Here. Trustee Siddiqui? Here. Trustee Light? Trustee Meritado? Yes. Trustee Pojack? Yes. Trustee Schroeder? Here. Is there any public comments? Okay, discussion regarding number one adoption of safety okay. standard for elevators. Excuse me. Additions. Oh. Uh, I got an aid on. Oh, okay. Uh, police department. Okay. Anyone else? Any other add-ons? No. Okay. A discussion regarding the adoption of safety standard for elevators. Can you have a rule call for adoption of safety standards for elevators? You don't have a motion. Oh, okay. Is there a motion need to discussion? Discussion. Okay. So, any discussion on that? Yeah. What, uh, Mike? What? What? What is this? Okay. I mean, so, this there are some uh, standards that we're trying to just shore up a little bit with our elevator code, and I'm going to let um, Tom Bialis from Community Development uh, take over from there. So we've, uh, we're about to send out our uh, 2022 renewals and for businesses, and we've had a slight change this year where we're going to actually include some of the fees for elevators with that. And in doing so, we identified the need to update to the current related codes associated with elevators and also take the opportunity to include the fees for elevator, uh, in the annual fee for elevator inspections, and to specify re-inspection fees. And that's what this uh, will we'll take, I mean, uh, we'll do. What could be, what could be, I mean, what else can they st be standard for an elevator? They go up and down. <laughs> I mean, you press it, they go up, you press it, they, they go down. You hope. There, there's standards for the inspection and operation of them, and this just, codifies that those are the ones that the village relies on as far as the, the installation, maintenance, and operation of them. Okay, thank you. Tom, when you say they're standards, these are standards throughout the state of Illinois, correct? Uh, if you look at the, the document, it makes reference to um, professional standards that have been adopted. Uh, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, ASME, ASME is the standard that's been, uh, we've had in the past. It's just we're bringing it up to the current version language. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other discussion? Yeah. Go ahead. No, I, I move that we move this to the board with a recommendation to concur. Second. Okay, roll call, please. Trustee Schmidt? Yes. Trustee Siddiqui? Yes. Trustee Miritato? Yes. Trustee Pojack? Yes. Trustee Schroeder? Yes. Mayor Coker? Yes. Number two, Republic Service. Service day change for residential curbside program for select multifamily properties. So. There has been a request from Republic Services to change the service day in a couple of the areas in town from Thursday to Friday. Uh, the contract does allow that with the Village Board's approval. Um, Tish Paul from Republic Services is here today to explain the changes that they're seeking. Good evening, Mayor, Village evening. Board. Thank you, Mike. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the Village of Glendale Heights. Uh, we were very excited and proud to be um, a platinum sponsor for the recent uh, classic golf outing 
um, that went very well and uh, got a chance to see a lot of folks that are here in this room as, as well as helping uh, with the recent uh, show and shine golf, not golf, but the car show. Uh, matter of fact, today I just got the certificate from uh, Trustee Light in the mail. So um, always here to be a partner with the village of Glendale Heights. As Mike mentioned, we're, we're coming to you probably for the first time in a long time asking for uh, a couple of schedule changes um, in, in the village. Right now, this is the current collection schedule. The village is collected on Thursdays and Fridays, uh, primarily um, bordered by uh, Bloomingdale Road. Uh, cutting the town basically in half. We're looking to make some changes effective October 22nd, which would be on a Friday. What we're looking to do is move some of the Thursday collection areas over to Friday. And there are a couple reasons for that. Operationally, we, we need to make some changes, move some routes around. Um, we've done this in some other towns. Uh, COVID has um, definitely affected our weights and what we're seeing people um, throw away and not just Glendale Heights and all communities. And that's for a number of reasons. We're seeing obviously more people are working from home. We've got kids at home doing school and we don't anticipate things changing a lot as things open back up. We're um, still seeing a lot of those, those heavy weights uh, come through. This map kind of gives an overview of some of the changes. So what you see in red are some of the subdivisions. Primarily what we are trying to focus on are moving some of the multifamily properties that are serviced as part of the curbside program. There is one uh, single family property that uh, was recently added, so you're, the information that you have in your packet may vary slightly from what you're seeing on the screen. The first area is, and this is what happens when you get old and don't have your glasses. <laughs> you gotta put your glasses back on so you could actually see stuff. Actually, I'll just look at it on my thing. This is the area north um, at the intersection of Army Trail and Bloomingdale Road. We're looking to move um, some of the multifamily properties at that northwest intersection and some single family homes in the southwest intersection of this area. These homes would these area these homes would move from Thursday to Friday's pickup area. The other area that is to the west um, had some discussion with uh, village administrator um, Mike earlier today. We need to look at this again because um, Dillon Townhomes currently already is picked up on Fridays. Um, so we think that this may be um, identified in error. We'll have to come back and, and, and look at that again, um, because if it's obviously, if it, that's the case, we won't need to move this one because it's already picked up on Friday. But we do believe there is some area north of Army Trail Road that is currently picked up on Thursday that we want to move to Friday. Excuse me. Yes. Getting back to that one, the Northeast, that's the, the, the uh, Havens Homeowners Association. Okay. And on Thursdays, that's when the lawn service handles everything. I'm sorry, on Friday. Okay. And uh, we don't, our garbage is picked up on Thursdays. This was tried a few years or many years ago, and they wouldn't change it because of the contract that the lawn service has. It's going to pose a huge problem in that area, that top the, right. The top right. Yes. Uh, there's well, 170 the top, homes. Top left, you mean, or top right? Top the right. East. The northeast area. So, so that area, Chester, is picked up on Thursday. Our garbage, yeah. Okay. 
And Dylan is on Friday. Dylan is on Friday. The blue. So I, what we can look at, because I know that there are some other areas where there's lawn care service and trash service, not necessarily just in this community, but in other communities, and we're able to work through it. Um, obviously, part of our outreach will be to the different homeowners associations for those who have homeowners associations involved um, to work with them to you know, make sure that it's a smooth transition for everyone. Um, one of the, like I said, we just really kind of need everyone's cooperation to, to make some of these changes. And these areas were identified specifically um, because a lot of them don't put out yard waste. If they're multifamily properties, you don't have curbside yard waste. Like you said, you have uh, a lawn care service. And we didn't want to um, overburden our yard waste collection routes, which are already very heavy on Thursdays and Fridays. So we really wanted to that's why we are primarily targeting the multifamily properties that don't have um, curbside yard waste service. But I, I appreciate you bringing that up. That's something for us to keep in mind. The other area was Glendale Lakes. This is another area we're looking to change from Thursday to Friday. Is that you? Yeah. The next area identified is uh, in the Wildwood Glen area, just south of North Avenue. And those are pretty much the areas that we're looking to target. Looking at probably anywhere between 500 and uh, five to 750 um, ish or 800 homes that we would be moving around in the community. Part of the communication plan, um, if, if the board um, is, is, gives us the blessing to move forward with this later this month, obviously this is a big change for folks. Um, you haven't changed garbage days in a while in this community. Uh, people are you know, very used to putting their trash out when they put their trash out. Um, so a couple of things that we've identified in order to help get the word out. We have the ability to do some automated phone calls to residents who pay us directly, uh, that we bill directly. And we've already talked to the village about um, using your code red system uh, to help uh, with phone calls, reverse uh, phone calls as well to residents in the affected areas to inform them of the, the schedule changes. We're also looking at uh, postcards being mailed to the affected residents notifying them of the day changes. And as I mentioned earlier, um, working with some of the property management companies and uh, HOAs that would be affected in these areas. And obviously I know the village would put something on your website uh, to let people know what's happening as well. I know it's kind of hard to see this, but this is just kind of a, a, a mock-up of what the postcard would look, up, look like letting people know that um, there's a day change coming up, important uh, information regarding your recycling and waste collection day. And on the back, it would indicate that your day is changing to Friday and when the first day of your new service would be. And any questions that uh, yes, Glendale Lakes. Yes, I I don't I don't know when they do their landscaping, but uh, maybe if you can contact the homeowners association, sure, and let them let them know about the change, and then maybe they can put it, because I know by my district they put out newsletters, so they can put that in the newsletter that that would change in the date. Yes, and that's one of the reasons why we want to work with the different homeowners associations um, and property management companies, because we know a lot of them do have newsletters that they can uh, put information in. Okay, like I said, I don't know, I don't know when they do the landscaping, but I don't know, you know. If I start getting complaints, then I got, I got your number. <laughs> so, no problem. I live at a homeowners association, <laughs> and my trash pickup day is Thursday, and... 
my landscaping is also done on Thursday. Is it? It it, it works. It, it 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 may seem like it's daunting, but it 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 works. Um, one of the other um, issues that uh, that came up was potentially uh, street sweeping. But there are other areas in town right now they get street sweeping and trash pickup service on the same day. We don't anticipate that that would be a problem either. But obviously, that's part of our contract with you. Um, we have the ability to to work with uh, that street sweeping service to. Um, address any issues that may come up. Ms. Powell, the only thing before you leave, I need your business card. Absolutely. Because you want to be able to dial me as quickly as, <laughs> as uh, he's, he's, much, he's much faster than I am. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm kind of laid back a while, but yes. Go call you in a heartbeat. Great. Any other questions? <laughs> I just want to say something. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I know you were a contributor to our golf course uh, outing, and I do want to say this. I don't golf, so I was a volunteer. Your volunteers were fantastic. Mm -hmm. Cannot say enough nice things about them, and you had so many of them there. I want to thank you on behalf of the village. We really appreciate it. They had a good time, too, and, and Sue told me to tell you hi. Oh, I tell her I said hi. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. So, Mayor, thank you, uh, uh, Trustee Siddiqui. The um, contract would call for um, the contract. The contract calls that the contractor can do this with village approval. And so, um, Don, I would think that there would be a, a, a motion. Yeah, um, yeah, we need a motion to amend. But I'm sorry, we need a motion to amend. But I'm thinking. I think Trish. Was it Trish? Was saying that she wanted to implement this by October uh, 22nd, and, and we could have this on the agenda to, I mean, officially amend the contract on the 21st if the board thought that was appropriate, if, if, if the board is prepared to move forward with those amendments. So it's a short turnaround, is I guess what I'm saying. It's a, it is a short, short turnaround, and actually, it, from my understanding, it really doesn't require a contract amendment. Um, it requires a certain number of, of days of notice uh, to, from us to the village and mutual consent and approval. Well, I, I haven't looked at it, to be truthful, but okay. generally speaking, I would think it would probably need some form of amendment to be memorialized as to the fact that we are, in fact, changing this. Um, but I'll look at that, and I guess we still have time. I'm, the 21st is one day before, the, before you want to do it. Well, there's a lot that needs to take place before that. Um, if, if we're going to get some mailers out, obviously um, we want to. We would need to get something out in the next week um, or next few days to make sure that people get it in time and they can prepare for it. We also need to um, make changes on our end operationally. We need to make sure that we're communicating with um, the different homeowners associations. Um, so that they know and if they can um, they have the opportunity to put something in their newsletters sure well. I get that I think that if the board um, the, the practice of the board is if if you hear them approve it tonight in a positive way I think there's a high expectation that on the 21st it, it'll be approved okay no. okay excuse me are, are we is that is that gonna give us enough time Mike to let the residents know about this change? With I the, mean, a week is not really, uh, I mean, a long time. Yeah, with the reverse dialing and the uh, use of the code red, we should be able to get a lot of information out. We'll push it out over social media as well um, with Facebook and, and uh, Twitter and uh, public relations will be able to push that out too. Um, fortunately, we're not moving it up. Yeah. We're moving it back. Yes. Um, so if somebody puts it out a day early, yeah. um, and it doesn't get picked up, and they're going to call, and they're going to say, well, haven't you picked it up? And we're going to say, well, it's coming on Friday. Your day's been changed. As opposed to having them put it out a day late and miss it as the right. truck's coming down and driving away. And they go, hey, what's going where'd it go? Um, so fortunately, it's going backwards instead of forward. Okay, so Dan, what do we, what do we need to do? A motion to um, concur. In the recommendation, as we've always done, 
um, would be appropriate. Okay. You're concurring in these changes that Re uh, Republic has uh, proposed. Okay. okay. And, and with that, we will move forward with the implementation and we'll um, memorialize it on the 21st. Correct. That's my thought right now. Yeah. Republic goes forward with all the things they plan to do, newsletter, post, postcards, everything, assuming the board, you hear them tonight say that it's, it's good to go. Yes, and I will um, wait to hear from you um, on whether or not um, it, it requires an official um, contract change or anything like that. So. Okay, so do you have the motion to concur? Yes. No, no, you can, you have to do on 21st, but unofficially, yes. Okay. Unofficially, you can do, you know, whatever, you write right. letter, postcard, whatever. If you want, you can also put on your bill, you know, you send to people that your day is going to be changed, you know, Friday uh, instead of, you know, uh, Thursday, you know. Yes, I believe. Unof yeah, unofficially, yes. Everybody's in favor of that, you know. Okay. So you can continue your working, you know, your services. Thank you for your services. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. We and we'll be working we, closely we with needed, your staff. We needed, you wanted to, we needed to move to the it board. to the board. Move, yeah. Okay. He, he, had, he has his hand up. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Siddiqui, you, yep. have, you are chair, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah. Con yes. Unofficially yeah. what I said, you know. Yeah. So it's. Oh, so. Trustee Schmidt has his hand up. We just yeah, call on. Go ahead. I move that we move this to the board with a recommendation to concur. Second. Second. Okay, roll call, please. Trustee Siddiqui. Yes. Trustee Miritato. Yes. Trustee Potek. No. <clears throat> Trustee Schroeder. Yes. Trustee Schmidt. Yes. Mayor Coker. Yes. Okay, we'll move forward. Okay, so number three. No, motion is approved. Motion to approve. Recommendation to concur is approved. Okay, yeah, concur is approved. Number three, municipal electric aggregation. So, so this is uh, by way of information. The uh, NIMEC, our uh, municipal aggregation company, has informed the village that they will be moving uh, that Illigo Energy, the supplier that um, we aggregated with back in February, will be moving fi up about 500 residents from Illigo Energy as the supplier to ComEd as the supplier. Um, the move back has to do with the anticipated increase in electrical rates uh, that's coming in the next few months. Uh, apparently natural, natural gas supplies have tripled in costs and that is going to have an effect on electrical rates. The, there will still be no change in rates that they're paying either Illigo Energy or ComEd. They'll all be paying the same rate um, just as it was before. They'll just get their supply from ComEd instead of Illigo Energy. I just wanted to let the board know uh, the postcards have gone out and will be hitting residents probably within the next couple days. With the Postal Service the way it's been, it could be next week. Um, once they get the postcard from Illigo Energy, they will receive a follow-up letter from ComEd confirming um, that that had occurred. The residents will have to do nothing, and they will notice no change whatsoever on their, uh, the rates that they're paying. The rates that they're paying will be the same. The only difference on their bill will say that the supplier is now ComEd or Exelon as opposed to Illigo Energy. Yes. How is this going to affect the payment to the village from? It will not. That is the purpose for them moving that 500 people over, um, is that they can still meet that contractual obligation that they have for that about $9,400 a month that they, they uh, contribute to the village. Any other comments, discussion? Do you have a motion to move? There's Just no action. Of, there's there's really no action. I don't see Trustee Siddiqui. Trustee Siddiqui. Okay, number four, village newsletter and village calendar. 
So again, this is one of those items that, that normally comes up when we have our budget workshops. Um, it's coming up a little bit earlier this year because we are moving into uh, the situation of needing to go out for bid for the calendar and for the village newsletter. The COVID pandemic uh, really changed the way a lot of people do business. One of the things that we changed in some situations was we went to an electronic village newsletter uh, on a couple of months. Uh, the reason we did that was because the information was changing so quickly. Uh, we normally prepare uh, the newsletter uh, a month in advance. So if the um, June, uh, July, August newsletter goes out, we, are, we have to have that done uh, by the 1st of June so that it can get to the printer, get to the, um, get to the post office and be sent. Um, so during the COVID pandemic, things were changing so rapidly that we held back on that and just did it electronically so we could make those changes very quickly uh, and residents would still have um, up-to-date information uh, as we went through the months. We um, obviously were looking at uh, the ability to do some cost-cutting measures. Um, we have the village calendar that goes out on a yearly basis. That is uh, with the printing and postage Roughly uh, $10,000 is expended on that. Um, we are expecting printing costs to go up this year. Uh, that was uh, intimated to us last year when we received our proposal for the calendar. Um, we had received bids. You may recall that we uh, rejected bids and accepted the proposal because we did a multi-year uh, bid. The multi-year bid was quite expensive because the anticipation of increases in prices for paper and ink going into this next year. Um, we are still anticipating that, we, although we have not see, sought the uh, bids as of yet. Um, so there's a dual question as to whether or not we move forward with doing a village calendar. Um, again, that's one of those that we are starting now in order to have it delivered to our residents by January 1st. Um, in so doing, we're putting information in the calendar that is a full 14 months in advance of when it happens. Um, and a lot of times we find ourselves going, well, it's in the calendar, um, so we need to not change things. Um, sometimes that's not operationally best, but because we've notified people and the residents that it's happening, um, it does not change, and we, we move forward with it. So the question to the board is, would you like us to continue to do a mailing of the village calendar? Uh, with the printing, mailing to each village resident, or do we substitute that with a, an electronic version, um, which we could update regularly, and if somebody wanted a village calendar, we would still put together what the calendar would look like, but it would go on our website rather than um, being placed in the mail in everyone's mailbox. Um, so that's the first one. The second one is the same issue with the newsletter. The newsletter is roughly... $30,000 a year with printing and postage. Postage is anticipated to go up. Um, and we, again, we'll have that same situation with uh, paper and ink costs for uh, the village newsletter. Uh, so the question again on that is, do we move forward with the printing and mailing of each village newsletter, or do we simply can still put together a village newsletter, put it on our website in an easily um, readable format and allow someone to say, hey, I would really like to get a newsletter and we'll send a newsletter as it's requested. Okay, uh, excuse me. Are, are we gonna, uh, we're not gonna, if we decide for the website, we're not gonna make no calendars at all, even if somebody wanted, I mean, if somebody wanted one, I mean, we'll just so eliminate it. If, if somebody wanted a calendar in that situation, it would probably look a little different if we printed that out as opposed to a newsletter, which would look very much the same um, as what we currently do um, if we were to print that out. Because a newsletter we could actually do on a, one of our copy machines on 11 by 17 paper. Um, but again, you know, when we do a newsletter, you have to do it in, in four pages. So if you go over a little bit with content, uh, you have to add another couple of pages or um, you have to take away 
four whole pages in order to keep the content correct. So it's a little bit more challenging with a with a online. You put the right the content that you need to put out there and not have to worry so much about the number of pages. So if we put it out there, then if something changes, we can go into we can go in there change the date. Yes. Change dates, change times, change what needs to be changed, update information, um, and you would be publishing in, in almost real time. So are we going to print the calendar? And, and I mean, how's this going to work? Are you going to print the calendar and, and the website? The calendar or are we going to go by day by day? Or, the I calendar mean, how, would be on the website. The calendar is on the website right now on a monthly basis. Right. Uh, and you can move forward. You can toggle forward through the months to see what's coming up. Um, for each month. So we would continue to do that. And so you would be able to see in January what's on the calendar in December, but if it needed to change, it could be changed. But if someone wants to, oh, oh sorry. sorry. Oh, go uh, ahead. Would you just uh, clarify this for me? If I'm not mistaken, you said $30,000 a year for the newsletter. Yes. And is that $10,000 a year for the calendar? Yes. And so that's 40000 I do want to say this. I think our residents look forward to that calendar. I don't know about any of you, but I really keep my calendars. I like seeing it, and, and I'm for the calendars mm -hmm. of being mailed to the residents. So I just wanted to voice my opinion. Okay. Yeah, my question is basically the same thing. If some residents wants the calendar to be printed and mail it to them, how can we do that, or is it just on on our website so it it would be possible and i'm going to look real quick i know we talked um david if you could jump in if um, we have talked about the potential of being able to print but i just don't know if it would look exactly the way it looks today as far as a calendar yeah i mean the papers that we have are just going to be more of your stock just basically what you have in front of you we could potentially order specialty paper to try to do it but we're also the difference between what we print in-house, um, we've all seen our copiers here, versus what a professional printer is going to do. Ink colors are going to be cleaner, brighter, clean, and look better in that sense. And then professionally bound as well, because we are printing on bigger paper, um, typically either a matte type paper or some type of format like that. So what, if we were to do it in-house, it would more than likely just kind of be like what you have in front of you. Yeah, I mean, I am all for the saving trees and digital, but some of our residents, as uh, Trustee Schroeder said that, you know, they like this to be a, like a physical copy and some, you know, put there on the refrigerator and it reminds them, okay, what's going on in the city. So, and I believe a lot of residents are gonna call for that. So, we have, do we have like a backup plan for that? If someone, some of the residents wants that, so we can mail it to them. Well, and again, that would be the backup plan is that we would okay. have have a, a method to do that. Okay. And now, obviously, if we get into thousands of copies, it, it's going to be a different situation. Mm -hmm. it, at that point, we would have to do a print. Print, okay. Um, Another option we could potentially do is have a small number of printed done by a professional printer mm -hmm. um, to have available for residents if they would like to come in and pick them up or if they request that we can mail it, of course. Oh, okay. um, but it, and then that would obviously save a lot of costs as well. Yeah. Um, but to mail out um, roughly 13,000 of these publications, mm -hmm. um, and it's really unclear of how many people actually are using those publications, you know, into, say, the calendar into September as their main source of what's going on in the village. It's, probably can be pretty minimal. Oh, great. Yeah, I really like that idea because maybe, you know, we can print some copies and have it on our city. So if anyone needs it, they can come and pick it up from here. Versus doing a, a Versus mass mailing. Versus mailing and all that, yeah. Because so printing a thousand would be much be better than 13. So and we yes. would, we'd have to indicate while supplies last type of, type of thing. Yeah. We, we won't know exactly mm -hmm. um, until we go into the process of how many would be... Um, requesting. Okay. Yes, Mr. Madden. Mr. Project. Thank yeah. you, um, mm -hmm. Mr. S Siddiqui. Uh, I'm in favor of uh, the newsletter and the calendar, but if you can reduce it, to me, it's like a Bible. You always can look at something. 
and I enjoy watching, uh, reading it, looking at it, but maybe don't send all of them out to every residence. Have some on hand if they want them. They can send out a notice. If you want a calendar, come into the village and get it. But I do, I would miss them if we didn't have it. So we did discuss an opt-in. If you wanted the calendar, that you could opt in for the calendar, and we'd have we'd print a thousand or twelve fifty and have them available, and then you know, either mail or they would come to village hall and do it. Uh, one of the local communities around us did a study on how long people keep calendars and brochures given to them by the village, and only fifty five percent of people actually keep them for a year. Right, um, vast majority are one to two months, or well, one to two months. <laughs> the other, the other, uh, forty-five percent. So, from a cost perspective, you know, many of our residents, especially our seniors, want the calendar in hand, right? Yeah. And we would certainly print enough to have for them if they wanted it. But to print twelve hundred or twelve fifty versus thirteen thousand is a pretty big cost savings for us. Right now, in our mail. We have about seven or eight calendars ready for next year. At least we get that. We just take them to the senior centers or whatever. For Reti different? Retirement from different associations. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, that's kind of the point of, the, of not mailing the calendar out, right? Because many people do the exact same thing. Right. Trustee Maritato, please. Mike, like, like Doug said, what, what if... What if we print 2,000 copies, put them on the front desk, people walk in, if they want them, they could take them, they could take one. I mean, we could do 2,000. Sure. I mean, we did two, I mean, I, I don't know, see what the board thinks, but I mean, yeah, it's a good idea. I mean, we're, we're saving money. I mean, because me, my, me myself, that I never, I never used the calendar, really. Yeah. I mean. Just, I didn't, you know. I always see I them at the golf it. course. Everyone who's ever golfing at the golf course, they're not residents all the time. They're just grabbing calendars. You know that, Dave. Sure. Right? They just grab it. It's it's free. Free stuff. People like free. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. Let's, let's do 2,000 and... Now let's see all the boards. See what, so, they want, see what they want to do. I don't know. So I would suggest, like, instead of quitting, like, free kind of thing maybe as david said that you know we can say that if you need it you can collect it at our village versus putting it so everyone is going to grab it no we just need it for those people who really need this like our seniors if maybe we can put it on our senior center and maybe on our village um, you know so people who really needs it will get it and we don't run out of it yeah, and, and have an opt-in for people that want to call and go, hey, can you mail me one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Bill. Yes, Bill. What if we uh, attach a nominal fee, like a dollar, for the calendar? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, we're not going to give, we're not no. going to, we don't take a calendar. <laughs> so, well, that, that's the thing. If you, people like free. If you, You're going to hear a people lot of complaints. Who need it. We're going to have 5,000 calendars. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Well, Madden, go ahead. Yeah. have you do some comparative study, you know, if some other village has done electro electronically, you know, these things, you know? Yeah, so I, I, I'm part of a, a national communications group, and I did toss it out there to see how many people were going strictly digital. Um, I would say it's pretty overwhelmingly most people have gone digital, especially due to the pandemic. Um, so a handful that we're doing either a combination of print um, and digital, like we're discussing now, um, and small amount that are just doing still print. Okay. So do, do we need an answer tonight for this to get this rolling? Or? Well, it, it, what it does is gives us the idea of whether or not we should be going out for bid on these. Um, because if we're going to go out for bid, we're going to need to go very soon. Correct, RC? Yeah. Um, Why don't you just cut it in half, see what happens this year? 
So, I mean, we could do the print 2000 and, and not mail them out and do an opt in as Doug is talking about and, and adjust that calendar program that way. How many um, calendars do you normally print? 13,000. 13,500 calendars. Well, Newsletters is about 13,000. Cut it in half, see what happens okay. as an experiment. I think half is still too too much. Yeah. Maybe 2,000 is good. And you know. Right. If, if we do half, it would, wouldn't be sending them out. Yeah because we wouldn't be able to send them to everybody. So um, we would have, if not too many people came in to get them, we would have a lot of calendars left over that just sat there. Yeah, the whole idea is going digital because I agree, yeah. a lot of villages and they are moving to uh, digital. So there, there are a lot of park districts that are using uh, digital recreation brochures. Yeah. Now, so what do we do? I mean, uh, we're gonna take a poll, or yeah. So, it, it, well, I guess let's start with the calendar. Um, we print two thousand calendars and run it as an opt-in. Let people know that they can get. The, we'll mail it to them if they want it. They just let us know they need it, and we'll send it to them and see how that goes for this year. Yep, that's a good idea. Sounds good by me. Same here. So, roll call or motion, voice. Yeah, you could, um, or, or if there's a consensus. Um, yeah. I, I certainly know two trustees feel that way. Um, I, feel, I feel that if you had 2,000 calendars for people to pick up, 2,000 people are not going to come and pick them up. If you're not going to mail them out, then I think 2,000 is a lot of calendars to leave lying around. But personally, I feel that the residents deserve a calendar. But that's my opinion. I, I really like the calendar, and, and I do use it all year long. I'm always with a calendar in front of me. If you go in my house, you'll find five calendars in different rooms in my house. I do use a calendar, and I don't think I'm the only one that does. But that's my opinion, and everybody I agree has an with opinion. you. I agree with you, Trustee Schroeder, 100%. So, so that's maybe that's why we have 2,000, you know, and we, uh, so Mr. Marin, we can mail it out to people if they want to, correct? Sure. They could yeah, so, so. Send us an email, give us a call, say they want it, and we put, we'll drop one in the mail to them. All right. All right, so everyone is agreed or disagreed, uh, uh, so who? You're going to keep some at the senior center calendars, a stack of them, yeah. some at the village on the main floor here, or what? Yes, yeah, sure. So if we, we do, sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, if we do 2,000, we can definitely distribute them to our facilities per mm -hmm. usual. Um, I think typically per facility, we usually give, let's say like 50, give or take, um, and then they can always request more if they run out. And I think the golf course, I would just eliminate that. Sorry, John. Golf course? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah, golf yeah. course. Right. Public <laughs> works. Definitely. Yeah. By, by the time they're getting it, it's a golf course. Over there. Three well, months I mean, have gone by, you, four you, months have gone by. They're not residents at the golf course. They're just taking it because it's free. And Yeah. I mean, they're looking at it or whatever they're doing with it. I don't know. But. File it under G. <laughs> so, <laughs> I ain't got no comment on that. So. Okay, so I think we have the direction on the calendar. Newsletter. Do we continue forward with printing a newsletter and distributing it village wide on a bi monthly basis? Or do we go to a similar situation where we maybe print a select number and do the majority of it on, um, on digital media? Instead of a two month, maybe we can go to three months. Four times a year. You, we, we could cut, that would cut obviously two uh, newsletters. Um, if we were to do that, the only, the only downside to that, sir, is that the uh, information would be that much more stale um, that you're putting in the newsletter because you would be four months now ahead, you'd be putting that newsletter together four months ahead of the last day of the newsletter. Um, because the newsletter would be for three months you might end up actually having to use more pages in order to get that extra month of information in there. So the what you would be saving is postage for two mailings. Okay. So can we go the same route as we are going for calendar with the newsletter? I, I believe we could. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And then essentially what we would end up doing once somebody would opt in, essentially, is we'd create that mailing list of four, five, six hundred people mm -hmm. that, you know, say, yeah, please keep sending me the newsletter. And now we're sending out maybe five, six hundred every two months rather than 13,000. I'm good. I'm voicing my opinion. You know what? Again, I think that newsletter is important, but I do want to say this. You know, the Senior Center sends out a newsletter, too, which to me is a waste because I think that Senior Center newsletter, which is just as big as our regular newsletter, could be picked up at the Senior Center because it's for the seniors, and everybody doesn't need a Senior Center uh, a newsletter. So that, to me, is a waste of money when we send that uh, senior center newsletter to all the residents. So that activity guide is not mailed out to all the residents. So what we do, and that could be similar to the opt-in program, is we actually send um, our printer a separate mailing list of all members of the center, and only members of the center receive that activity right. guide. It's not village-wide. It's not going to everyone? No. All right. I get one, and I'm not a senior, but I don't even look at it. Oh. The letters only go out I don't, to I, really. I don't look only, at it. The letters I, I only go out to the seniors. I don't know how many. Ch I don't know how many's on the Are list, but <laughs> I want to say the list is roughly about two thousand addresses based on their membership at the the center. Even the sports hub, we get we get one from the sports sports hub. Well, that's another. And that's up. a thick one. It's another option as well. I, right. We've only brought up these two, but the Sports Hub, again, a lot of park districts. Keith, I know you, you've talked to a lot of park district uh, directors, have gone to the digital, um, yep. and maybe they send out a postcard and say, okay, the new brochure is ready to view online, and that's that. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, we're kind of in the same situation as David mentioned. It's pretty much most... Park districts have gone to a uh, a web-based program guide, and they do, most of them do at least send out a postcard or something that says, hey, the new brochure is out. Just to be clear, like for the sports hub, it's not like we're going to be stopping doing this. We still have to put our programs out, but it'll give us the opportunity to also be able to add and try and get people to constantly come back to the site to see whatever programs can be added. I go ahead. I like the idea only because we can change it on the fly. If something comes up, we can change it. If we change it, if we change uh, like the low league, if we want to change the price, you know, if it's forty dollars and we want to drop it to twenty five because we we're looking for more kids, we can put twenty five. If you just put in a newsletter. Nobody's on note unless we do it again. We run it. So I like I, I like I like that idea, but so Mr. Mayor, uh, eventually we will be going digitally. That's what the plan is, correct? Slowly we start this, and moving forward we go. It, it does move us in that direction. Direction, yes. okay. There yeah. there will still be individuals that. Mm -hmm. prefer to get it in, in their hand, look yep. at it, flip through it, read it at their leisure like that. Um, and so it will, I don't think it will ever completely go away. Yeah. Uh, but this certainly takes us in a huge step towards going more digital. Yeah. Uh, we're going to 2,000 rather than 13,000. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's huge. Yeah. And that makes sense. Because, you know, we, we also have a residence like myself, which wants digital copy. I really don't need that. It's like if it comes to my home, it will be... I will be putting it somewhere and I forget it because everything is Recycling on, on your phone nowadays. Everything is, is, and I understand like, you know, some of our seniors and which are used to that. So for that, we're going to keep that until they feel comfortable, you know, going digitally. So, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those that still likes to read a book that's in my hand. And I don't want to yeah. see, I want to turn the page. I, it's, so you don't like Kindle? From no. no. Okay. <laughs> you know what? If if, nope. it, if it doesn't work, we can always go back. We change. We change. Right. I mean, it, there's. I mean, it's our option. If we want to stay with it, or next year we decide, you know what, this isn't working. Let's go back to the old way. We'll make a plan. We'll implement it. Huh? And we'll evaluate it after we see how it's running. Right. Let's let's do it for a year and let's see what happens. Yeah. Okay. 
So we'll do the same thing with the village newsletter. We'll print 2,000. We'll do it on an opt-in basis. We will not send them to each individual home. That's fine. Starting in January. Start, yes, yeah, starting with January, February newsletter. Correct. We, I, I didn't put it in the in the memo. We alluded to it here just a couple minutes ago. Do we want to look at doing the exact same thing with the Parks and Rec brochure? Yeah, well, up to me. Yeah, why not? I say let's go for it. And, and actually, we looked at software, Trustee Maritato, that really mimic. It's pretty pretty cost effective, quite honestly. That literally mimics the what the brochure would look like in hand. So you can flip through it, scroll through it. Um, it just it would look like you were looking at a uh, paper copy, but it's electronic. Click a button, it flips the page for you. Right. I don't know. It's just that's up to me, in my opinion. Let's go for it. I mean, let's, you know, let's do it. So you're going to do 2,000 newsletters, then how many calendars? 2,000. 2,000 also? Yes. All right. And brochures will put online, uh, rec brochures will put online, send a postcard, say, hey, you can look at the brochure online. Sounds good. All right. So you don't need to do it. Do, okay. I think there's direction that we don't need to, any okay. motion or anything. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. All right, move on to number five, technology committee. So, so I, I placed this on the agenda uh, based on the information we kind of talked about at the last meeting, uh, at the last board meeting. We didn't really kind of finish that conversation, so I wanted to give us the opportunity to finish that conversation. If the board was interested in creating a technology committee uh, to take a look at our financial reporting software, et cetera, um, if for no other reason than to just review what we currently have, see what other options are available, and the technology committee can then say, okay, we either have what we have is, is adequate for what we need, or there is better software uh, that we can look towards, and if it's the decision is made to implement it, um, we could move forward with that. Um, but like I said, we did not finish that discussion. I wanted to kind of bring that back around. Uh, and give the board the opportunity to talk about that. No, I'm really glad that you bring this up because it's, uh, w w what was the last time we evaluate our software and all that, like, you know? So we have been with, and um, Bill will probably be able to help me out a little bit here. Uh, we have been with what is currently Central Square mm -hmm. um, in some iteration since the uh, millennium. So in 1999, uh, the financial reporting software that we had, uh, there was thought that it was not going to make the switch over to 2000, the Y2K issue, uh, and they, the village went and looked for uh, a new software system. Uh, that What they decided on at the time was the program that we, well, it's not exactly what the program is, it's that company Obviously, the program has made many changes in the last 21 years. Um, you know, when we first had it, I think we talked about it before, it was on an uh, in-house AS400. Um, I think that's what it's called. Bob will yell at me later about that. Um, now it's all cloud-based. Um, you know, it's, it used to be green screen. Now, you know, obviously, it's all Windows-based. So, you know, there's been many changes to it uh, and upgrades along the way. Um, but we have... I mean, we're, we're comfortable mm -hmm. with this program, um, to, put it, to put it mildly. I mean, this is the program everyone knows, um, and we're comfortable with it. So it's not always a bad idea to evaluate. And, you know, we just talked about we make a plan, implement it, evaluate. Probably haven't evaluated that system in quite some time. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not a bad idea just to to see what's new in the market and you know what can be safe if any and and how it because 20 years a lot of things has changed being in IT I know it's uh, uh, we used to have the rack of servers but those are now paperweights those blades of servers are basically useless because everything is in cloud 
So things have changed and probably, you know, we will find some better solutions to what we have right now. So I am, I really appreciate that you brought this up because I forget it, but since I see and I am the one who, who initiated that, so so yeah, that's definitely a good idea. So I am up to the book. Okay, Chester, you have something? Yeah, who's on this uh, technology committee? Anybody yet? D nobody. Uh, it's, nobody uh, right now it's just, a, it's in just infancy. An, this is, does the board want to go forward with it? And if it does, it, we could have volunteers who wants to be on it and, and the uh, attorneys would come back with a resolution at the next board meeting, uh, establishing the committee, the tenure of the, the board, et cetera, of the members, yeah. et cetera. Yeah, so. Do we want a committee? Yeah. Should be don't for. Don't look at me. For the <laughs> yeah, don't look at me because I'm, I don't want to be on a committee. That's not, yeah. my, that's not my forte. That I, it would also be more of an ad hoc committee. Technical stuff is so. not my yeah. deal. You're like me. That, that's I'm strictly in concrete and blacktop. No, I like the idea. And golf clubs. And golf. <laughs> So I think we have a we have one volunteer for a committee. Yeah, I am here. <laughs> How about you, Doug? You you want to be in that? Yeah, I mean. Sure. We certainly would have staff members on it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Staff and certainly finance needs to be involved. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, IT needs to be involved, yes. right? So there needs to be a con you know a consortium of uh, departments involved on the committee so that everything yep. flows through. What do you think, Mayor? Yes, I will go ahead, you know. Because <laughs> when you start talking, I don't understand a word you're saying. It's way <laughs> over my head, so I don't want no part of that. That's why we want to make a committee said. so... <laughs> I'm closing this right now. <laughs> <laughs> we can bring a, a resolution back and work with Mike and Doug. It sounds like Trustee Siddiqui's somebody from the board. If there's, any, if there's anybody else from the board that wants to be involved, please just tell Mike. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it would be an ad hoc committee, so it would yeah. only be uh, in existence until such time as it makes a recommendation and then goes it's done. Okay. Mr. Marin, are you talking about the software we saw, you know, uh, in the last meeting, uh, Oak Brook, you know, for inspection, house inspection, you know? That, that is a, a, a small part of it. Um, what we are, really, it's the financial reporting software that we utilize. Um, that is the, the real crux of what we do with our software. That is the main portion of SunGuard. Right. SunGuard, HTE, Central Square, it's all the same. Okay, it, it, yeah. it, it's changed names so many times I can't keep track. Thank you. Okay. So number six, Peterbilt Trucks. So, um, back in August, the board passed an ordinance that allowed us to purchase a uh, Peterbilt chassis cab to replace the lift all. So, please make sure I'm going the right direction here, Rachel. <laughs> to replace the lift all uh, truck that is over 20 years old. So, the board uh, gave us the permission. We issued the purchase order and before the purchase order could be accepted, uh, Peterbilt came back and said, well, we're not going to accept this because we want a surcharge of $5,000 over the price of the actual um, vehicle that we had received on the joint purchasing contract. Before we could even respond to the surcharge, they canceled our purchase. They canceled the order completely and said, nope, we're not even accepting this. This is all based on the chip shortages, supply chain issues, et cetera. And Peterbilt is not really sure where they're getting their, their trucks from at this point. Um, we have been notified that they are going to, once again, start taking orders, but they're going to do it on an allocation basis. So if um, somebody goes in and says, well, I want 40 trucks, they're not going to allow that. They're going to try and split it up amongst the individual municipalities or businesses that want to purchase these trucks. Um, there is a two-year lead time at this point is what they're estimating. So we are looking at the potential of waiting for this liftoff for two years if we're able to 
get one at all. Um, and we're anticipating them to open this allocation up within the next week or so. When that occurs, we feel we're going to have to move rather quickly in order to secure one of these vehicles. Again, the lift all is over 20 years old uh, and it needs it in need of replacing. Um, we're anticipating, and, and this is a wild, at this point it's kind of a wild guess because Again, you know, we ordered it. I think it was seventy-six thousand dollars. Darcy was the bid. Um, they asked for a surcharge of five thousand dollars, and apparent so that would have brought it to eighty-one thousand. And apparently, that wasn't enough either. So, to tell you, I know what the price is going to be when it comes out next week. I, I wouldn't try to guess. Well, well, let me say this: I will try to guess and say that it could be in the area of ninety thousand instead of the seventy-six we paid a couple of months ago. That said, so we're looking for the authorization to be able to just move on that with a ratification at the next board meeting. Secondly, um, because of the two year lead time, we have another vehicle that is going to be coming due to be replaced within the next two years, obviously. Um, so based on that, we would look to try and get a second three ton Peterbilt in order to replace uh, which number is it? One of the three ton dumps that we have uh, that's, that we use for snow plowing, et cetera, um, because of that two, two year lead time. Uh, the last three ton that we purchased was approximately $220,000. Um, and we expect that obviously the next one that we purchase is gonna be higher than that. So if these become available, we're looking for the authorization of the board to let us move forward, place those orders, and we'll come back and uh, ratify it at the next board meeting. Okay. Pat? Why are we not looking at internationals? I mean, why, why, why are we doing Peterbilt's? So about four or five years ago, we had made the, rec the recommendation um, to standardize the trucks to the Peterbilt's. The reason for the Peterbilt's is that the international, the um, internationals were having a great deal of trouble. We were having trouble with the internationals uh, breaking down on a regular basis. Um, and there were some, there were some major issues if what I recall. Could you remind me what that was? You're correct, Mike. There were some recalls with the uh, manufacturing, uh, recalling some of the vehicles back because of design problems. And also we were finding that the, re the resale value of the internationals was really low. They were not holding the price at all when we come to sell them on. And we also anticipated getting uh, another five years of life out of the Peterbilts as opposed to what we were getting out of the internationals. Are we, are we buying them off the, the uh, state contract? Yes, it's a joint purchasing contract. I don't know if it's the state, Darcy. State contract? It, it is. Source well. So what you're saying is that we got to buy something now and wait two years for it? Yes. And the price is not going up? Well. The price is not going to go up within good. the next two years? The, the price that we're given should be the price that we pay two years from now. But that's why we're expecting it to be a, a good deal higher than the 76000 that we paid, that we were going to pay just two months ago. And so then, of course, the, the three ton will be e even more expensive, obviously. Because so we're just we, buying a we, chassis for the lift all. So we buy a truck for $80,000. Two years from now, it's going to be $80,000? That's the idea. Hopefully. We will place the order, then they confirm the order. It won't go into production until the third or fourth quarter of 22. So it's basically we're placing the order, they're confirming the order. It's just the lead time for the parts and that puts it into production at the end of 22. So unless there's some kind of surcharge that they're going to try to assess us later in the process, which we're hoping they don't, um, they should, whatever we're quoted is what we should be paying in, at, at the invoice price. So 
we pay them and we pay them two years from now or we have to pay them now no you pay upon delivery upon delivery so okay okay that, is there's okay. no guarantee with that price though after two years right Normally, we would say that there's a guarantee. It's just the way that the supply chain has been going now, and we've seen some some surcharges that we've haven't seen, and I've never seen in my in my uh, history. Um, I'd like to say that they wouldn't assess us a surcharge. I'd like to see what the paperwork comes back at when we see it next week. Um, if if it confirms that we won't have any surcharges at this point, we're kind of waiting to see what happens. Well, then as long as we don't pay them. I mean, until delivery, it doesn't no, matter. Have, it yeah, doesn't matter because then we can just back out of the deal, right? Yeah. From the, they're only taking orders. That, this is what he had said on the phone too: is they're only taking stock orders. They're not putting regular orders into production. So if something falls through and we don't take this truck, they'll have plenty of people to sell it to for a much higher price. Will they penalize us then? We shouldn't be. I mean, if if they if they're not going to honor the price that they quoted, we shouldn't be penalized at all. Man, keep your fingers crossed. Okay, so then right that right time. Yeah, if, option, if, if they can, if if when it comes time for delivery, if they try to surcharge us an amount that is not acceptable to us, I guess we don't take delivery. But that that obviously could be difficult because we need this lift and we need this. The stump truck. So, but at least we can evaluate it at that point if it's not the num yeah, if it's okay. not the number that we agreed to. Yeah, it sounds good. As long as we ain't paying for the whole the whole freight now. Correct. I think this needs um, Trustee Siddiqui a motion um, to recommend it to the board with a concurrence because we're going to be ratifying it. They're going to be taking action before our next board. Okay. Do I have the motion though? I'll make a motion to uh, or send it to the board. Concur. Concur. Yeah. Concur. Concur. I'll yeah. second it. Okay. Roll call, please. Trustee Pojak. Yes. Trustee Schroeder. Yes. Trustee Schmidt. Yes. Trustee Siddiqui. Yes. Trustee Maritano. Yes. Mayor Coker. Yes. Motion on proof. Thank you. Okay. So now we move to. Number seven, presentation of water treatment plant project updates. So Thankfully, this one's not mine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's short. What are you we'll work on that one. <laughs> oh, it's already up here. All right. Good evening, Mayor Coker, board. Uh, my name is Chris Marshinki. I think I've met pretty much everybody at this point. Um, but I am a project manager with Trotter & Associates, uh, handling the design and construction engineering for a number of projects at the village's wastewater treatment plant and we just wanted to give a brief update on the projects that are currently in construction and answer any questions that you might have. Um, feel free to ask any along the way as we're going to. Uh, the three projects that I'm going to really briefly go through are the digester rehabilitation, the non-potable water replacement project, and the wet weather improvements. Uh-oh. Well, that was quick, technical difficulty. Oh. She changed it for you. Yeah, thank you. Right side, okay, thank you. Uh, so first one is digester rehabilitation. This is uh, the village's uh, large capital improvement project currently underway. Um, it essentially includes rehabilitating the existing, what we say, offline digester that you're looking at right there. Uh, essentially a steel tank uh, on top of a concrete foundation. It was constructed in the late 1970s and has been unused for about the last 20 years. We identified it as uh, a piece of existing infrastructure that we could repurpose for digestion capacity at the wastewater plant um, to, to meet a need, and we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but the scope is essentially rehabilitating this offline digester and then replacing blowers and pumping equipment that, that support that digestion process. So why are we doing that project? Uh, essentially, it is a requirement um, to comply with the Illinois EPA's permit limits. So the village holds what's called an NPDES permit that allows discharge of treated water into the Armitage ditch after it's treated at the, pl at the plant. That permit requires a number of um, effluent limitations be met on a constant basis. One of them 
is that digestion of all the sludge generated in the process uh, meets certain thresholds. So it, it's essentially a uh, requirement of that NPDES permit that the village currently has. And on top of that, uh, we've talked about the phosphorus removal project that's forthcoming. Um, that will be uh, another capital project. Um, that's an EPA requirement as well. And by extension, that requires expansion of the existing digestion facility to handle the additional sludge generated when we start removing that phosphorus. So uh, a couple of tiers to why we're doing this, but uh, essentially an Illinois EPA mandate. Progress on that one. So we are currently in week 10. We started at the end of July, so really just getting started. Uh, all of the demolition within the existing digester is completed. There was a lot of piping and concrete work uh, that isn't needed for what it's going to be used for next. That is all complete. The rehabilitation of the steel and concrete is currently underway. There's some patching that needs to take place to make it watertight again. And the next steps will be coating the interior and exterior steel with a high build structural lining to ensure that it, it lasts into the future quite a while, uh, being that it is an older piece of infrastructure. Uh, the only administrative item to note on this one is that the first payment application will be before the board at the next meeting. Moving on to the non-potable water replacement project. And when I say non-potable water, really all that means is we're using the treated effluent water within the plant for non-domestic purposes to run certain pieces of equipment and things like that. Um, that's referred to as non-potable water. So this project is replacing all of the piping, hydrants, and valves throughout the plant. It includes quite a bit. There's about 2,500 linear feet, or about half a mile of piping at the wastewater plant alone of this non-potable system. And we're replacing it essentially because it has uh, failed due to age. So on, on the left, a little bit hard to see, but you can see some of the heavily corroded pipe. Uh, most of it was installed in 1986 in the rehabilitation project then, some of it earlier in the 70s. It has just reached age, has corroded through, and has failed under pressure. Uh, that failure has kind of dictated that plant staff um, move over to utilizing potable water, so actual village domestic water, uh, for these processes that don't require clean water. Um, so that, that presents a demand on the water system that we would rather not have, and also a cost in that it's, it's water coming from DuPage Water Commission that, again, we would like to avoid. So replacement of the system will allow us to operate the plant on the non-potable system using the treated affluent again, rather than, than treated domestic water. So that project is also in week 10, started about the same time, uh, end of July, but will be complete in the next couple of weeks here. So all of the site piping valves and hydrants are largely installed. We're currently pressure testing to make sure all of the piping um, meets our standards, isn't leaking, anything like that. And uh, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be restoring and closing out that project. Similarly, the payment application will be before the board at the next board meeting. The last project, the wet weather improvements project, uh, includes modifications to what we call an excess flow bypass structure. Uh, essentially, it's improving the way that staff can divert flows in the plant once we get really heavy rainfalls and we're trying to treat as much wastewater as physically possible. So there's a couple of improvements with this one that will allow staff to split those flows better. And that kind of goes to the necessity. Really, we don't have the option to split flows at the, the tail end of the process. Right now, staff has to either choose to send all of the flow to uh, the disk filtration, kind of the final step of the process, or none of the flow. It's kind of an all or nothing split. So the, uh, the work that we're doing is making it such that they can send most of the flow in one direction to filtration and bypass the other as needed. Uh, so, so it pr provides more flexibility and in doing so reduces any kind of a risk of violation of any of the effluent limits in the village's permit with the state. That project is currently in about week 26. There's long lead times associated with that one. So really construction has been going on uh, on site for probably the last two months or so since we received some of the manufactured components. But that one will also be finished up in the next two weeks or so. Um, all the structure modifications have been completed. The clean-out structure installation was actually just completed yesterday and today. And with that, uh, we'll move into restoration and closeout. And similarly to the other two, the uh, payment application number one will be uh, before the board in a couple weeks. The last item that I think is in here that hopefully works is just uh, a drone video of a flyover of the site showing some of these. Um, 
that the village took. Let's see. Let's see if it starts. So again, you're just looking at the offline digester right now that's kind of at the, uh, the start of the plant, right when you drive into the plant. That's the first structure you'll see on the west end of the plant. As it pans over, you'll see the excess flow clarifiers, the two large tanks on your right. And on the left with the dome is the existing online digester. So the village only has one digester currently in service. Uh, the expansion will give us two digesters to complete the, the processes that we need to. So it'll kind of make its way down the road, the access road, working its way east. Uh, on the right-hand side is the tertiary filter building, one of the last steps in the process. On the left-hand side, you're seeing the sludge processing building where sludge, after it's been digested, is dewatered and disposed of. And then uh, the, the equipment that you're seeing here, the excavator and the hydro excavator, are excavating for the non-potable water. So in that trench is where the existing non-potable piping is being removed out of and the new piping is being installed. And I think that's about the end of the video. And in the background, uh, kind of the, the upper right there, you can see the, uh, the snow fencing around what is the bypass structure modifications. That's the wet weather improvements project. So all three taking place on the plant site, so kind of tight quarters for that construction, but we're approaching completion of the two smaller projects that uh, the digester rehabilitation will be going on for the next 12 months or so. So you may be getting more updates on that one uh, over the next year or so. That's, that's essentially it. Uh, there's no, no action needed by the board, but wanted to open up for any questions you had and give you a, an update on the, the progress of the projects that the village is undertaking. Is everything going on schedule? Yes, yep, so everything's looking very good. Um, we're just starting into the digester rehabilitation project right now. Uh, our, our biggest concern is any delays associated with, as we just discussed, um, lead time issues on equipment. So especially uh, things like steel and copper and uh, PVC piping, anything polymer based has very long lead times as a result of obviously the COVID pandemic, but also the, um, the freezing conditions in Texas back in February are still affecting the, the supply chain of anything that's polymer based. Um, but right now we haven't heard of any of that from the contractors. We're keeping in regular touch with them and all of their vendors uh, and saying, if you're hearing anything, let us know as soon as possible, but nothing to date. And it work all, all through the winter? Yep. Try to? Yep, it will. So um, the next push will be on uh, coating of the digester. Following that, there's going to be installation of a lot of piping within that digester that can go throughout the winter. There's no real, uh, there's no real reason to halt construction for that. Okay, thank you. I just, I just wanted, an up, you know, just take a look at update. Yeah, absolutely. And we're spending a lot of money, you know, so mm -hmm. it's nice to take a look and see what's going on. You think, Rachel, we can get another update maybe in about another four months? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Um, you mentioned about piping, you know. Is metal piping better than PVC or PVC? Yeah, um, I don't know that there's a, there's a right or wrong answer to that no, necessarily. No, really. So we are using all ductile iron, so very rigid piping in the plant, uh, as opposed to a PVC. Um, PVC is very corrosion resistant, so we'll use that in a lot of water main and sanitary sewer out in the right of way. On a treatment plant where we have, uh, we are digging frequently and we would be hitting these pipes with every project that's going in and new utilities going in, we usually use a rigid pipe so that when they're digging, they don't hit a PVC pipe and burst whatever that line might be. Um, so if inside uh, a wastewater treatment facility or a water treatment facility, usually we'll be using um, ductile iron pipe. And what about those uh, tree roots, you know, affect our tree roots, you know, on PVC or metal so on the plant site we really don't see too much of that just because there's there's trees essentially just around the the border of the property here um, but that is a significant concern when we're talking about sewer pipes so out in the sewer system throughout the village um, and it and it's a concern with most materials that you would use uh, root intrusion can get through just about anything over time um, it's more when the pipe starts failing itself it'll start working its way into some of those failure points um, but on the treatment plant site, we really don't have that issue. Okay, thanks. Okay, any other questions? No. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So, Trustee Mer Meritato, you have. Oh, I got yeah, one thing. Uh, Doug, you remember a while back that uh, Mohammed said something about the cameras? Do we do we ever do we ever follow up on anything like that? Yeah. So uh, actually, we have a grant application in uh, Bureau of Justice opened up their grants and actually are allowing almost any community to apply. We generally don't qualify for justice grants because of we we're in DuPage County and we're we're in DuPage County. Uh, but they've opened it up. We've actually put a uh, application in for uh, those cameras, uh, actually 15 of them. Ooh. And uh, one other item, I, I forget exactly what it is. George? Yeah. We also did for AEDs. Um, I'm trying to get the grant for that too. Right, so for... Uh, but I have no idea when that grant is going to be awarded or if it's going to be awarded or if we're going to qualify and be awarded it. But we put that in the day the grant opened about three weeks ago. Oh, good. All right, thank you. That's, that's all I had. I just wanted to see what, what was going on with that. Okay, thank you, Doug. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other questions? Um, do I, okay, there is none, so... Do you have a motion to adjourn? Yes. First. Second. Okay. Second. All right. Committee on the whole is adjourned. Need a vote. Uh, roll call. Oh, roll the vote. Sorry. Roll no printing. Trustee Pojak. Yes. Trustee Schroeder. Yes. Trustee Schmidt. Yes. Trustee Siddiqui. Yes. Trustee Muratato. Yes. Mayor Coker. Yes. Your meeting is adjourned.